everybody, it's Romania Black, and uh, this may seem like a very weird thing for me to react to, but uh, there's a reason. <laughs> so we're looking at Over the Garden Wall, um, this short series, it's 10 episodes, they're about 11 minutes each, so it's about two hours altogether for the whole series. Um, originally, I was looking for some things I wanted to use as YouTube sub goals. So if I reach a sub goal on YouTube, I would watch a movie or a short series that equals about two hours of screen time or less. And I had lots of requests and uh, Danny, a YouTube subscriber that was on a live stream I did this summer was like, hey, if you reach 8,000 subs, you should watch Over the Garden Wall. I said yes, because it sounded intriguing and lots of people were like, oh, it's great. And then when I went to go find it, I was like, oh, this is not an anime. <laughs> It is a cartoon. It's a Western cartoon uh, series, but it's not anime, which may seem weird on this channel because I usually do Dong Hua and anime. I, I would like to keep it around that, but if I reach sub goals, I'm not opposed to doing this or Into the Spider-Verse or like an animated movie. I'm not opposed to animated movies. I don't really want to get into live action stuff. I, there's so much out there, but if I reach a sub goal, Sure, I, we should do that, but that's what we're doing over the garden wall, and it's getting to be fall, it's festive, seems like it'll be a great fit, or at least that's what I've been told. So, I know virtually nothing about this series. All I know is that it's festive for fall, and apparently it's really good. That's all I know, and that it's a western cartoon, but that's it. So, <laughs> I'm excited to see what is all entailed, but... Thank you all on YouTube, on Patreon. I 8,000 subscribers is insane to me that you all want to listen to this kooky teacher talk about anime and manga and just share her crazy shipping thoughts and things like that. So I really appreciate all the support. I would love to keep doing sub goals like this and watch movies, um, whether it's a Western cartoon movie or an anime or donghua. I would love to do that in the future. So hopefully that will continue. But I'm super excited to dive into this. I The only reason I really know about it is I know Semblance of Sanity that is another reactor group that I've watched before. I know they did reactions on this a while back, but I don't remember much about it. I didn't watch it obviously because I figured it might be something. I thought it was an anime, so I was like, oh, I'll eventually watch that. But here we are. So cheers but it is it's a little bit cool outside the fall weather has kicked in i've got my warm mug of coffee and i'm really i'm ready to sit down and just watch this straight through my plan is that we're gonna do the reaction down below that's gonna be the entire series straight through and then i'd like to go back in the discussion and maybe tackle it episode by episode and as a whole which is gonna be again very unlike what i'm used to watching multiple episodes of something in a row this feels wrong <laughs> But it's fine, right? Mm -hmm. It's fine. So, yes. But I hope you all are excited. I can't wait. So we're not going to waste any more time. We're going to dive right in and see what happens in this series and see what it's about. Should be fun, right? And we're going to do that here in three, two, one, and let's a go. Oh my gosh, that was absolutely precious. I, that may be like on my list of new Halloween fall things to watch. <laughs> because it was just so good. Oh my gosh, this has been out since 2014. It's been out nearly 10 years. Oh my God, it's been out nearly 10 years and that's amazing and I love it and I think I might watch it every fall now because it's just so, it had such a Halloween, I mean it takes place on Halloween so that fits. It had such like a fall vibe to it and the idea of just like, and the idea that as they go it gets colder and colder and they've fallen into the lake and they are drowning and then they get saved. I, oh, I, I really love that. That was amazing. It felt like for the runtime that it has, um, it was 10 episodes, 11 minutes, it was about two hours altogether. It could have been a movie, but I think it's smart to have it as like a little mini series. Um, there was lots of things that it seemed inspired by because I watched a lot of cartoons as a kid. Um, it definitely had a, a Courage the Cowardly Dog feel to it in that there are elements of it that were just creepy. But they were never, I, I mean, Courage the Cowardly Dog, if you know that series, it was definitely a creepy series and it was intentionally so. This one had like, it was creepy without being scary. It just, there were some elements that just seemed weird and you were like, oh, that's weird. And then, and then you just went on, right? 
but oh my gosh, I I feel like this being around in 2014, Elijah Wood was doing a lot of uh, voice acting for ser from movies around that time and a lot of animation voice acting. So this is probably one of them. He's perfect as work. Elijah Wood does a great job of playing like the overbearing older brother that's like in high school and he's like oh little brother get it and they're half brothers so there is a disconnect there like he's like oh you're just you're they have the same dad just different moms and or no they have the same moms just different dads and he's just like what are you doing and I love the idea of these two brothers and is it real is it not real was was the unknown a real place or was it not it kind of has a very Wizard of Oz feel where you don't know in the end if it was a real thing or not the only thing that kind of sucked was that I really wanted, I at first, before we realized that this was based on real-time events that was happening, back when we thought this was all just like a fantasy story, and I thought maybe they just lost their way going through this fantasy world, before we get to that, I really had wanted, I wanted Wirt and Beatrice to get together, and then when Sarah comes in the picture, I'm like, oh, leave her, forget her, and then they end up being together at the end supposedly but that makes more sense once we figured out who Jason Funderburker was it was like oh he's awful <laughs> then once we found out who he was and you could see Sarah visibly was not going to date him and it's like oh well we're you're just selling yourself short don't be like that come on now and see that they could be together then then I was kind of more on board with Wirt and Sarah getting together. And I like at the end, he's like, let's not start with the mixtape that I made. Let's, let's back up a little bit. Let's back up a little bit. I, I just, I absolutely loved so much about this series. So much. It was such a joy to watch from start to finish. The, the animation is, um, it's the same people that produced um, Adventure Time and Flapjack. Which I've watched a little bit of Flapjack. The animation is exactly like Flapjack, which is an animated cartoon. Um, and Adventure Time, I watched a lot of, and that it's the the humor is very much like Adventure Time. It's it's very reminiscent. What is so cool about Over the Garden Wall is it combines a lot of things because in a lot of modern American animation, there is this kind of irreverent. There's this humor that's kind of tongue in cheek and sarcastic, and the humor kind of breaks the fourth wall where it's almost like the characters kind of know. The characters making the jokes know that their jokes are breaking the fourth wall. A lot of American cartoons in this modern age do that. And I'm fine with it as long as it's not over the top. But what this series did really well is it blended that with this very like 1940s, 1930s kind of old timey Mickey Mouse. Like I was thinking of Oswald the Rabbit. I was thinking of like really old Looney Tunes from the 40s, like the style of it, the creepiness of it. I was thinking of like the the big, um oh, the big monster, not the Balrog, but he's like the monster in the old shorts and the skeletons dancing in a circle. Like all those old timey cartoons from the US that are just really, really creepy, but kind of like have this weird charm to them. And that's kind of how this was. I love that it was a musical. I love that it's a musical. It won an Emmy, which is amazing. I love that. And apparently I'm looking at like just the, the article about it. Apparently they made a graphic novel series out of it and like a 20 issue comic series, which I could see this going on. Like they go back and have more adventures in the unknown. Like you could expand that so much because these characters are just so weird, but interesting. And I just kind of love the world. The world building of it is so fascinating. Yeah, it very much has this early like 1900s 1800s like Americana feel to them that is so interesting and the musical are very like old ragtime musical numbers and like old jazz it's it's cool and the time period seems modern but like not today modern it seems very reminiscent the way that Wirt was dressed seemed like kind of 1970s 1960s was the vibe maybe as far as the clothing went and the police and stuff went like the automobiles and the clothing it all seemed like 1970s was when it actually took place in i i just love it it's so good colin dean played greg greg is probably my favorite character i mean i loved elijah wood's portrayal of wirt as an elder sibling myself i could relate a lot to wirt's struggles because my little brother is like five years younger than me wirt and greg seem to be like at least five or six years apart but Greg's character, oh my god, like from the first episode, Greg's character just throwing the candy. The way he was drawn, I want to just put him in my pocket and run away with him. He was so freaking cute. 
Like it just, I, the animation style and everything, I was on board from the beginning. And I loved just the twists and turns that the story took. So let's go by it episode by episode. Um, the very first episode, perfect pilot. I just, the, the, the candy trail, getting to the old man. I like the subversion where we think the old man is the beast. We think he's not the beast, but then we think he's the beast. And then we find out later he's not the beast. And the, the whole thing with the lantern but it's like just setting the creepy vibe. I love the idea of the black turtles like coming in and out of the series and we start with those. It had a very Spirited Away quality to it as well, which Spirited Away kind of deals with the idea of like being in limbo between life and death sort of thing too. So I, the, the world that Chihiro goes in, in Spirited Away kind of is that limbo world and that's sort of what the unknown is here. And I, I got that feeling like you had the the goop that the monster in Spirit Away swallows and it corrupts him. That's like the first episode. The dog was corrupted by the, the turtle with the oil on it. The oil that's the, the magic oil that keeps burning, right? And so I thought that right off the bat that was really, really cool. I liked how that was developed and I liked the tone that it set right off the bat. Um, the second episode, the second episode was when they met Beatrice. Beatrice, they went there and then they went to the the creepy ass like cult <laughs> at Pottersfield. Pottersfield, they went to the cult and there were like the the big pumpkins and like the cult Mayfield festival. And then you find out there's skeletons. It's like a town of the dead. And they're like, well, you'll come back eventually. I was like, that was so creepy. Again, it was, they put all these creepy elements in but then it's kind of harmless. Like you're not truly in danger, but it's just kind of just, it has that edge to it, right? It was just perfect for Halloween. And then the third episode was when they were going to, let me see if I have the third episode, the uh, hard times at the Husk and Bee, the Bluebirds. Yes, the Harvest Festival, they finally end up doing, like you think something really bad's gonna happen to them and instead it's like they end up doing manual labor and they just help like get all the people together. So then um, we have to go to see Adelaide of the Pasture, right? The School Town Follies was probably the weirdest shit. <laughs> Of all the episodes, I think the farm, t the school town follies was just the weirdest thing in the world, right? The weirdest thing. I was just like, what the heck is, is this? <laughs> it was great. I, I really loved it. It was just, um, the a creator of it is Patrick McHale who did Adventure Time. But yeah, the, the school town follies where you have the old lady, oh Miss Miss Langtree and her benefactor father and she's got old Jimmy, oh Jimmy Brown. Jimmy Brown was played by Hank Hill from King of the Hill, which that voice, uh, it's so iconic. You can just tell what it is. I was like, what the heck? But just like the animals, like, oh, who knew that the school for talking animals wouldn't be profitable? <laughs> And then the little potatoes and molasses song that was so adorable. It was very like old timey cartoons and that callback. It was just absolutely wonderful. And then we get our first like trip of songs of the dark lantern. So we go to the tavern. The tavern people warn the brothers about the beast and that it'll turn people into trees to burn the oil for his lanterns. That episode was really creepy. Um, not because of the beast stuff, but because all the people in the town, like in the house, they all had a job and all had a duty. And it was like they were trying to convince Wirt that he has to be a specific person and fall into a niche and that he has to do this niche job. And for a hot second, I thought that it was going to be like a Courage the Cowardly Dog kind of fake out where you're, where the, the people in the tavern were all trying to trick Wirt into becoming one of them. There's a lot of moments in the series where it's trying to like make Wirt and Greg become one of them and they resist throughout the whole thing. But for a second, I thought that the tavern people were trying to convince Wirt to become like a certain person. Like you're going to become the lover or you're going to become this. And then Wirt was going to start singing a song with the tavern people. And then Greg was going to have to like get him out before he like turned into one of them or something. And that's not what ends up happening, but it still has that like creepy, you don't exactly know what's going to go on. And then we find out Fred the horse can talk. <laughs> and Beatrice has had a spell cast upon her, a curse, which is interesting and so, yeah, they end up getting away from the woodsman just long enough and the woodsman is convinced that his daughter's soul is in the lantern and he has to cut down Edelwood trees to keep her alive. So, and then episode five is Mad Love where they go, oh my God, they go to 
pretend to be nephews of Quincy Endicott, the tea man. That episode was just bonkers because, like, you find out the two people that are so rich, the rival tea makers, their mansions are so big they connect and they never realized it and they thought each other were ghosts. And then they fall in love. I like that along the way, it was like, okay, it was sort of like Wizard of Oz where we had Fred the horse. He ends up finding a purpose being the tea horse for the Endicotts and the one woman. And then you have the frog that goes from being Dr. Cucumber to Benjamin Franklin to George Washington to finally Jason Funderburker. And he like finds his a contract playing music on the frog boat, which the frog boat had a very Thumbelina vibe to it. It was like Thumbelina meets Mark Twain. <laughs> had a very like vibe with that. But I'm, I'm, I'm here for it. And then um, Beatrice, obviously, she gets to go home with her family, her giant bluebird family. And it's just really good. And the idea of two cents. I, I loved Beatrice and Wirt's developing relationship. I feel like even now that we know that it supposedly was a dream, although the frog at the end has swallowed the bell. So what do we do with that? Um, but I like the idea that Beatrice kind of represents for Wirt him talking to a girl and making that connection with her and gaining confidence in himself because that's the thing word word is not a bad person like he's compared to jason funderburger he's a catch and he just doesn't realize it. he doesn't have that confidence in himself and you want him to feel confident so he can ask sarah out and i feel like beatrice in a lot of ways beatrice was a manic pixie dream bird <laughs> she really was I, that's kind of what the only the only flaw i have with the series is like she literally is a manic pixie dream girl, Beatrice is. She doesn't really have a purpose other than to show Wirt, oh, but dude, you got the spunk in you. You can win the girl in the end. It's kind of, yeah, it's like summer and 500 days of summer. She's just kind of, Beatrice is just there to like give him the confidence he needs to go and do the thing, you know? That's kind of why I like Scott Pilgrim because Scott Pilgrim takes the manic, manic pixie dream girl of Ramona Flowers and makes it to where Scott's like, wait, I don't need somebody else to tell me I'm a great person. I need myself to tell myself I'm a great person and the, the value of self-love and all that. It's a small flaw. I loved this a lot, but if I was going to pick one little nitpick, it is Beatrice being the manic pixie dream bird to help Wirt figure out his problems. But that's a minor, minor complaint in the whole series. I just wanted them to get together and the show isn't going to let it happen. So boo. Lullaby in Frogland was hilarious. I loved the, the, the tadpole babies and they kept kicking them and everything. That was so ridiculous. Oh my God. And then just all of the old like humor tricks in the book, like the three people in a, in a trench coat, the frogs like just going with it. Um, but I liked that episode so much because it was Wirt and Beatrice like slowly getting to know each other and Beatrice realizing that she doesn't want to take them to Adelaide and she's like, uh, and she feels like she's going to betray them. But then after growing attached to them, they end up going to Adelaide's house. And for the record, I, Adelaide was hilarious. Like the old witch, she's like, I'm melting away. And then used like the yarn to tie them up and everything. I really thought Adelaide was going to be a bigger plot line in the story than she was, but we only have so many short episodes in this. I feel like if there was the comic series, they probably could have expanded upon it in more detail, but it's fine. I, that's absolutely okay. <laughs> but it was really good. And then of course, Wirt is hurt by her betrayal because even though Beatrice tries to explain, he thinks it's her fault and he runs away. And, you know, a lot of this is kind of Wirt's coming of age of realizing that he needs to take charge and be a leader and become, like, a more independent person and, like, someone that's confident in himself. And then Greg's, you know, and to be a bigger brother and to help his brother, you know, Greg. I also got, like, lots of Hocus Pocus vibes where um, Max is kind of like Wirt where he's the big brother that's, like, kind of has a little sibling. He's like, uh, although Wirt is a lot nicer to Greg than Max is to Danny in Hocus Pocus. But by the end of the series, both of the older brothers kind of realize they have to help out their siblings and be the big brother. And that's kind of like, this had a very old school storytelling feel where the woodsman's like, you're the older brother. You have to be responsible. Like that should have been the sign that it was all a dream. And that it was just him learning these life lessons as he's passed out in a lake. <laughs> The ringing of the bell is, I don't know, picking my favorite episode. Ooh, that's hard. The ringing of the bell, Auntie Whispers, is played by Tim Curry. The Tim Curry. 
the great Tim Curry, who has voiced so many amazing characters from my childhood. I love Tim Curry so much, and he voices Auntie Whispers. I was like, oh. That was such a great reveal and twist, too, because you think Auntie Whispers, again, we talk about Spirited Away, Auntie Whispers has this, like, big Yababa, like, just creepy design that looks so freakish and abnormal, but then you find out it's Lorna that's the one we have to be afraid of. She's got the spirit, and Auntie Whispers was just keeping her in line with the bell. I just, oh, my God. It's great. It's great. And then in that episode, I like that this story followed like the structure of by the time we get to episode seven and eight or chapter seven and eight, that's kind of the, the turn in the story towards the climax, right? Where we see that Wirt is starting to lose hope that they're ever going to get out of the unknown and he's starting to lose his way and the beast is, is liking this. The darkness is liking that, which honestly... If, now that we know that they were sinking into the pond, around episode 7 and 8, when it starts getting snowy outside, is around the time they're starting to die from hypothermia in the lake and drowning. And so it's kind of fun how to see the story take that turn, right? That Wirt begins to lose hope. Then we have Babes in the Wood, which I feel like this is Greg's turn to see what he's been dreaming about this whole time while they're drowning. And we see that he, like... I, that one felt very old school. I mentioned it in the reaction. It felt very old school. Like I was thinking of Unico, where like the winds and nature as personification, the old 1960s, um, like claymation, uh, Western animations all had like personifications of the elements, like Jack Frost and the winter winds were personified. And it had that feel to it. And it was just, it was so, and even some of the, the animals there had a very 1930s Disney feel to them, the way they were drawn. It was very cool, but I liked poor Greg. Poor Greg, like, making a deal with the Beast to trade his life for his brothers. Like, the brothers, like, sacrificing each other to save them. So good! And then Into the Unknown and the Unknown. Those two episodes, back-to-back, -back, were so good. Like, just going back to the present, seeing Wirt, like, putting his mixtape together for the person that he likes. And the fact that it was poetry and clarinet music, I was like, oh, God, oh, God, buddy. High school woes. Um, and then it get, like, getting into her jacket and him going off to find it. And Greg, like, getting them caught. And then they go over the, the garden wall and they jump to miss the train and end up in the lake. Like, it was just such a great little, it was a nice little before we face the final, you know, battle within the unknown. We go back to see how we got here. Like, that was such a great narrative tool to start out where we don't know much about the world outside of these two boys in this fantasy realm. And then the penultimate episode, we find out, no, it's been taking place in real time. This is just like a Wizard of Oz dream world that they're stuck in. And it's like, okay. And then, yeah. And then we have Beatrice navigating work to try to find Greg. Greg's been in the... I, I love Christopher Lloyd as the woodsman and him seemingly chopping up the trees to, like, feed the soul of his daughter that's stuck in the lantern. Who's not been lost all along. She's there. And then, God, I love that the Beast is like taken on by Wirt and them and they find out that he just needs the lantern lit so the beast can live. There was a moment where the lantern like flashes on the beast and it looked like it was like inside out or there was something creepy about it. I was like, oh no. There was a moment where the beast looked terrifying and you got just, you just got a glimpse, the littlest glimpse of it, the tiniest glimpse. That's all you get. But it was like the littlest glimpse of the beast and it was terrifying. And I was like, oh, okay. But it had just like that, that feeling of being uncomfortable and uneasy throughout the entire series, but it was funny and it was cute and it was very festive and fall and Halloween-y, but there was just enough creepiness to give you that little edge of unease. It's like, yes, there's just a little bit that you're like, I don't know if I should question this, if I should be worried about this. I guess not. Like, it was just so good. I loved it. And then Wirt and Beatrice say goodbye. The Beast... They resist the beast lies, extinguish the lantern, and the beast is no more. And then Wirt and Beatrice say their goodbye, and Wirt wakes up in the pond, pulls Greg out, and they end up getting taken to the hospital. And we go back to the present, and it's it felt like the end of, of a labyrinthian story where Wirt and Sarah, they get together. Greg's okay, telling all the stories with his frog. And then we see, like, all the residents 
and what they've been doing after the beast is gone. And then Greg puts the stolen rock back in. I love rock facts! <laughs> I just love Greg was just so freaking cute. Uh, he was my favorite in this whole thing. I loved Greg so much. Every time Greg did something, I just wanted to, like, praise him. But, man, I'm so glad y'all recommended this because this was such a fun watch. I... I always have a series of Halloween go-tos, like I have Labyrinth, I have Hocus Pocus, I'll do Young Frankenstein, I'll do Nightmare Before Christmas, I'll do a lot of Halloween movies throughout the month of October, and this is going to get added to it. Just the fall festiveness of it, the feel of it, it's so freaking cute, and it's just also kind of creepy, but also like not, not scary enough you can't watch it, and... I, I want to watch it every fall now. I want to get a big mug of coffee or a mug of like hot tea and just sit there all wrapped up in a blanket and watch it. It's so good. It's like lightning in a bottle. Like there's part of me that would love a sequel to this, but there's another part of me that's like, no, no, it's actually perfect on its own. It doesn't need anything else, but I just loved all the theme of it. I love the coming of age story. I loved Greg and the, and Wirt and they're like brothers, like learning to trust each other as brothers and take care of each other. I loved like all the little themes about growing up and about trusting people and about like making your own decisions and I and about like not questioning like the unknown. Again, you had people the idea of not questioning. They think that the the town, for example, in, in Potter's Field is like all full of like occult villains and they know it doesn't turn out to be like that at all and things just not being what they seem like that's that's the big thing is things don't always they're not always like what you think and we see that time and time again throughout the series so i really loved this i want to see if there's any other um like acclaimed tim curry obviously playing voice colin dean colin dean was so good as greg i freaking loved him um samuel ramey it sounded like james earl jones samuel ramey as the beast that deep voice, oh, so good, Samuel Ramey. Yes, please. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Tim Curry is Auntie Whispers. John Cleese was Quincy Endicott. Okay, John Cleese is in Monty Python, The Holy Grail. Lots of things. I was like, that voice sounds familiar. Yes, please. Um, Deborah Voigt was Queen of the Clouds. Um, Bebe Newworth was Margaret Gray. I love it. I just, it was great. I thought this was so wonderful. Um, I just, the music, the soundtrack, the animation, the humor, top notch, top notch, y'all. <laughs> I'm so glad I got to watch this with y'all. So thank you, YouTube, for giving me 8,000 subscribers. And thank you for giving me to watch this new fall classic that I will watch every fall from now on because it's so adorable and I freaking love it. I want all the Greg things. I love he was an elephant. <laughs> I still don't know what exactly Wirt was supposed to be. I'm like, I guess he was a wizard, but sure. <laughs> Again, it felt very 1970s, but uh, God, it was so amazing. I loved it so much. So I don't know. I've talked to people on Discord that like for 9,000 and 10,000 subscribers, 10,000 needs to be something special. But um, for 9,000 subscribers, I definitely want to watch like a movie. Like it could be something Western, like Into the Spider-Verse or Spider-Man um, I haven't seen any of the new Spider-Man with like Miles Morales. I haven't seen any of those yet. Um, it could be a Studio Ghibli film. There's a couple of those I haven't seen yet. Um, it could be a new animated film. It could be a Japanese anime film, a Donghua film. I want to definitely do a film for the 9,000 ones. So, um, I'll probably, uh, ask you all about that when it gets closer, but this was so good. Mm. My heart. Mm -hmm. So... In any case, I'm curious to hear your thoughts down below, what you all thought of this uh, series and of this reaction. I thought it was wonderful. I can't wait to watch it again. I'm definitely going to have it on this month to go with my Halloween movie, like, extravaganza. Gonna have it on. Super freaking cute. Love it to pieces. But yeah, I'm excited to hear your thoughts down below. But I hope you all have a wonderful week. Please stay safe. Take care. And thank you all so much for watching with me with Over the Garden Wall.